in order to determine the charge, potential difference, and stored energy for each of the three capacitors, what we first need to do is simplify this circuit until we have one single equivalent capacitor. And in order to do that, we would first note that C1 and C2 are arranged in series. We know that when capacitors are arranged in series, we can find the equivalent capacitance by obeying this equation right here, which basically tells us to take the sum of the reciprocal capacitances, and then we can solve for the equivalent capacitance. So for example, if we come down and redraw the circuit, again, these two we are going to combine in series. We know that for a series arrangement, one over the equivalent capacitance would equal one over C1 plus one over C2. And so we're going to use the values for C1 and C2 to find the equivalent capacitance. We'll plug them in. C1 is 10 microfarads, and C2 is 5 microfarads. You might want to pick up a calculator and add the right-hand side together. When you do so, you're going to get 3 tenths. So we have 3 tenths microfarads. is still on the bottom. And then to solve for the equivalent capacitance, we can just reciprocate both sides of the equation. We basically flip it around. So you end up with CEQ over 1, which is just CEQ, and then you'll have 10 over 3, which is 3.33, and now we have microfarads. So once you find the equivalent capacitance, what you want to do is go back and redraw your circuit, but combine those two capacitors into a single equivalent capacitor. So here's what that would look like. Next, we note that the equivalent capacitor and the capacitor marked C3 are in parallel with one another, and when capacitors are arranged in parallel, we can obtain the equivalent capacitance by simply summing the individual capacitance values. So it's actually a little easier when they're in parallel to find the equivalent capacitance because we're just going to add the 3.33 microfarads to the 4 microfarads. And of course, when we do this, we're going to get 7.33 microfarads. So then we'll redraw the circuit, but we'll combine those two parallel capacitors into a single equivalent capacitor. So here we have that simplified circuit. We finally have it down to one equivalent capacitor. Next, what you're going to do is calculate the total charge on this equivalent capacitor. And that is straightforward because it's simply the capacitance value times the potential difference supplied, and that was given as 100 volts. So here we would have our equivalent capacitance of 7.33 microfarads multiplied by the 100 volts. And when you multiply this out, because we are using microfarads right now, your answer will come out in microcoulombs. So you're going to get about 733 microcoulombs. Once you have this total charge, you can go back and label it on your capacitor. And then you're going to start working your way backwards through the circuit. And when you work your way backwards, you want to follow these two rules. Bring the potential when moving backwards to a parallel arrangement, but then bring charge when moving backwards to a series arrangement. Keep those two rules in mind. We'll show you how to apply them right now. So for example, when we move backwards from this capacitor to the two from which it was derived, these two, we would be moving backwards to a parallel arrangement. And so the rules state that when you move backwards to parallel, you should bring the potential with you. Remember, the potential on this capacitor was 100 volts. So we're going to move back and bring that 100 volts with us. So that means that the volts on this capacitor is 100, and the volts on this capacitor also is 100 volts. Now, you'll notice we don't have the charge on either of these two, but we can determine that because charge is capacitance times potential. So basically, you just multiply the capacitance and potential values to once again get the charge on each capacitor. So when you multiply these two numbers together, you're going to get 333 microcoulombs, and when you multiply these two values together, you're going to get 400 microcoulombs. You continue working your way backwards through the circuit, and this time, when you move backwards, it's a little tricky to see this, but, whoa. This capacitor, you may recall, 
was derived from these two that were in series. And the rules state that when you move backwards to series, you should bring with you the charge value. So we're going to bring this 333 microcoulombs back and place it on both of these capacitors. So the charge Q1 on this capacitor C1 will be the 333 microcoulombs, and the charge Q2 on C2 will also be 333 microcoulombs. C3, we have already obtained all of the known values. Those were these values here, so 400 microcoulombs of charge and 100 volts. Notice we don't have the potential value yet on C1 or C2, but from this equation, we know that Q divided by C would give us the potential. So we're basically just going to divide the charge by the capacitance to get the potential values. So here, if we divide 333 microcoulombs by 10 microfarads, we would get 33.3 volts. And then the same idea here, we will divide the 333 microcoulombs by the 5 microfarads to get 66.6 .6 volts. So now that we have all known values on each capacitor, we can begin to answer the questions. So we'll go back to parts A, B, and C. Part A wanted the charge Q3, part B wanted the potential V3, and then part C wanted the stored energy U3. To find the stored energy, you use this equation here. The stored energy is equal to 1 half CV squared. So for part A, which again wanted the Q3 charge, we have already obtained that in our diagram right here. So we can say that Q3 is equal to 400 microcoulombs, or to get that into a standard unit, you can multiply by 10 to the minus 6. That would get it into coulombs. And 400 times 10 to the minus 6 is actually 4 times 10 to the minus 4 coulombs. So this would be the correct answer for part A. Part B wanted the potential V3, but we've already obtained that right here. It was 100 volts. So that is the correct answer to part B. And then again for part C, we're going to use U equals 1 half times CV squared. So we'll call this U3, we'll plug in C3, C3 was 4 microfarads, make sure you convert that into farads by multiplying by 10 to the minus 6, and then multiply that by the potential of 100 volts squared. And when you do that, you will get about 0.02, and that will come out in the unit of joules since it is a unit of energy. So there is the correct answer for parts A, B, and C. We basically do the same kind of thing now for the next two capacitors. So we'll clear out some space here, and then for parts D, E, and F, we're going to be doing this process on capacitor 1. So for part D, we need Q1. We've already determined that. That is this 333 microcoulombs. To get that into just coulombs, you'll multiply by 10 to the minus 6. And of course, when you do that, you can simplify that to 3.33 times 10 to the minus 4 coulombs. So this would be the correct answer for part D. In part E, we want V1. We've already determined that. It was 33.3 volts. And then we'll go ahead and we'll do part F here. And we'll get U1, which is 1 half times C1. C1 is 10 microfarads. We'll multiply that by 10 to the minus 6 to get it into farads, times the potential of 33.3 volts squared. And when you work this out, you will get about 0 0.0055, and this will be in joules. So there's the correct answer for part F. And finally, we'll do this all for the third capacitor, C2. We'll do it up here. So what part are we on? A, B, C, D, E, F, part G. 
we want Q2, which is 333 microcoulombs. We've already shown how that's equal to 3.33 times 10 to the minus 4 coulombs. Part H, we want V2, which is 66.6 volts. And then part I, we'll go ahead and get U2, 1 half times C2, which is 5 microfarads. So 5 times 10 to the minus 6 farads times the potential squared. Punch this in, and you're going to get about 0 0.011 joules. And that is correct answer for part I.